On June 4, 1979, Flight Lieutenant John Jerry Rawlings was released from his prison cell by junior officers in the Ghanaian Armed Forces, staged a violent revolution in Ghana. He was awaiting execution after he was put on open trial and sentenced to death for the attempted coup of May 15, 1979. But for us to fully understand the reasons why he staged a violent revolution in Ghana, we need to go back in time and begin to trace from the fall of Kwame Nkrumah in 1966. Please come with me. Welcome to this edition on History Media, your in-depth history channel. Remember to like this video and hit the subscribe button if you have not done so yet. It will go a long way to help us. Thank you. On the 24th of February 1966, the government of Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown by the higher echelon of Ghana police and the military. The coup plot has justified their takeover by claiming that the administration of Kwame Nkrumah was abusive and corrupt. They also had a problem with Nkrumah's aggressive involvement in African politics and his belief that Ghana troops could be sent to fight anywhere in Africa. And finally, they pointed to the undemocratic tendencies of the Nkrumah regime, which inadvertently affected the morale of the army. But was this coup able to solve any problem? Well, despite the vast political changes that were brought about by the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah, many problems remained. For instance, even though Kwame Nkrumah's coercive power and personal charisma seemed to have created a sense of national unity, the underlying ethnic and regional divisions within the society were yet to be addressed. Creating a sense of nationhood became a real challenge for the government. As a consequence, successive new leaders faced the problem of forging different ethnic and sectional interests into a real Ghanaian nation. The nation's economic burdens occasioned by the extravagance of the government of Nkrumah continued to cripple successive governments' ability to foster the rapid development needed to satisfy even the least popular demands for a better life. The discussion about the type of constitutional government to adopt continue to dominate the agenda among the educated Ghanaians. While some favored a strong central government, others felt otherwise. Many Ghanaians remained committed to known political leadership for the nation, even in the form of a military rule. And these problems would continue until the June 4th Revolution in 1979. The leaders of the coup that overthrew Kwame Nkrumah immediately opened the country's borders allowed the release from preventive detention of all opponents of Nkrumah and opened the door for those on exile to return. The National Liberation Council NLC, composed of four army officers and four police officers, was formed and immediately assumed executive powers. The NLC formed a cabinet of civil servants and promised to restore democratic governance as soon as possible. But. The ban on the formation of political parties remained in force until late 1968. However, a representative assembly to draft a new constitution for the Second Republic was formed and submitted a draft proposal on January 26, 1968. With the opening of the assembly, political party activities was allowed to commence. By August 1969, when the first competitive nationwide election since 1956 took place, five political parties had been formed. The major contenders were the Progressive Party PP, headed by Kofi A. Busia, and the National Alliance of Liberals NAL, led by Kola A. Badema. Interestingly though, Critics associated these two political parties with the political division of the early Nkrumah years. This was evident as most of the old opponents of Nkrumah's CPP found themselves supporting the PP. Similarly, the National Alliance for Liberals was seen as the successor of the CPP's right wing, which Badema had headed until he was removed by Nkrumah in 1961. The enthusiastic Ghanaians trooped out to vote in the parliamentary elections held on August 29, 1969. In the end, the election demonstrated an interesting voting pattern. For example, the PP won 105 seats, while the National Alliance of Liberals got 29 seats. 
When the National Assembly met in September, Busia, the leader of PP, became the Prime Minister. Then, an interim three-member presidential commission composed of Major Afrifa, Police Inspector General Halley, and the Chief of the Defense Staff, Major General A.K. Okran, served in place of an elected president for the first year and a half of civilian rule. However, the problems of the nation remained. But in August 1970, the commission dissolved itself. Meanwhile, before stepping down, Afrifa expressed some criticism of the new constitution. For him, the constitution served more as a barrier to the rise of a dictator than as a blueprint for an effective and decisive government. Thereafter, the Electoral College chooses Chief Justice Edward Akufo-Addo as president. Addo was one of the leading nationalist politicians of the United Gold Coast Convention UGCC era and one of the judges dismissed by Nkrumah in 1964. Meanwhile, with his position being almost ceremonial, all attention remained focused on Prime Minister Busia and his government. Having a parliament of intellectuals, so much was expected of the Busia administration. Many Ghanaians hoped that a new government would take decisive decisions in the interest of the nation in contrast with the Nkrumah years. The NLC assures the people of more democracy, more political maturity, and more freedom in Ghana. In fact, these were the same individuals who had suffered under the old regime and were therefore thought to have understood the benefit of democracy. The Busia government went to work immediately. Two very popular policies were initiated. First, the expulsion of non indigents from the country, and second, measures were taken to limit foreign involvement in small businesses. These policies affected Lebanese, Asians, and Nigerians, who were perceived as unfairly monopolizing trade to the disadvantage of Ghanaians. While these policies appeared popular, many others were unpopular. Busia's decision to introduce a loan program for university students who were at this time enjoying free education and his decision to devalue the national currency were challenged. Also, the government decided to constrain trade development in rural areas in order to address developmental imbalance. This led to the question, was rural development more important than the needs of the urban population? Again, harsh economic realities foreign and domestic debt burden, inflation were major problems for the government. To make matters worse, the prices of the country's major export commodity, cocoa, remained volatile. Factors such as competition from neighboring Côte d'Ivoire, a lack of understanding of free market forces, accusation of bureaucratic incompetence in the cocoa marketing board, and smuggling aggravated the situation. Another factor of a reliance on recommendations of the International Monetary Fund, especially in the austerity measures adopted, was also a great challenge. The recovery measures also severely affected the middle class and the salaried workforce, both of which faced wage freezes, tax increase, currency devaluation, and rising import prices. These measures precipitated protests from the Trade Union Congress. And then, in response, the government sent the army to occupy the trade union headquarters and to block strike actions. However, the army upon whom Busia relied for support were themselves affected by these same austerity measures. Knowing that the austerity measures had alienated the officers, the Busia government began to change the leadership of the army. This, however, was the last straw. On January 13, 1972, within 27 months, Lieutenant Colonel Ignatius Kutu Achampon, who was temporarily commanding the 1st Brigade around Accra, led a bloodless coup that ended the Second Republic. Neither ethnic nor class difference played a role in the overthrow of Busia. Despite its short existence, the Second Republic was significant in that the development problems that the nation had faced came clearly into focus. The impact of the fall of Ghana's Second Republic cast a shadow across the nation's political future because no clear answers to these problems had emerged.
According to one writer, the overthrow of the Busia government revealed that Ghana was no longer the pace setter in Africa's search for a workable political system. Both the radical left and the conservative right had failed. So, what was the way forward? The political direction of the nation became uncertain. At this time, Ghanaians were unable to arrive at a consensus on the type of government suited to address their national problems. It was this situation, the inability of the Busia government to satisfy diverse interest groups, that ostensibly gave Achiampong an excuse for the January 13 takeover. Achiampong's National Redemption Council, the NRC, claimed that it had to act to remove the ill effects of the currency devaluation of the previous government and thereby, at least in the short run, to improve the living conditions for Ghanaians. Under the circumstances, the NRC was compelled to take immediate measures. Although committed to the reversal of the physical policies of the Busia government, the Achiampo, in contrast, adopted policies that appeared painless for Ghanaians and therefore popular. But unlike the coup leaders of the NRC era, members of the NRC did not outline any plan for the return of the nation to democratic rule. To justify their takeover, however, coup leaders leveled charges of corruption against Busia and its ministers. In its first year, the NRC government drew support from the public pleased by the reversal of Busia's austerity measures. The new government revalued the currency upward, repudiated foreign debt, and rescheduled debt repayment. Later on, the NRC nationalized foreign-owned companies. While these measures were popular on the streets, they did nothing to solve the country's real problems. If anything, they aggravated the problem of capital flow. Now, unlike the NLC of 1966, the NRC sought to create a truly military government. In October 1975, the ruling council was reorganized into the Supreme Military Council SMC, and its members was restricted to a few senior military officers. The intention was to consolidate the military's hold over government administration and to address occasional disagreements, conflict, and suspicions within the armed forces. Little input was allowed from the civilian sector. Officers were put in charge of all ministries, departments, and parastatals. Meanwhile, Ghanaians had hoped that the administrative change would solve the problems of overbloated bureaucracies. Hence, Achiampong's popularity continued into 1974. His government provided subsidy for basic food import, encouraged self-reliance in our culture and the production of raw materials. Operation Feed Yourself program was launched as well. The program enjoyed some initial sources, but support for the program gradually began to wane. Also, when world cocoa prices rose again in the late 1970s, Ghana was unable to take advantage of the price rise because of low productivity. Moreover, because of price control, farmers along the nation's border smuggled their produce to Togo or the Côte d'Ivoire. A feeling of disappointment with the government grew particularly among the educated Ghanaians. Accusations of personal corruption among rulers also began to surface. However, to protect themselves, the government issued a decree forbidding the propagation of rumors and banned a number of independent newspapers and detained their journalists. Also, armed soldiers attacked student demonstrators and the government repeatedly closed universities. Despite these efforts, the Supreme Military Council by 1977 found itself constrained by mounting non-violent opposition. While various opposition groups called for a return to civilian constitutional rule, Achampon and the Supreme Military Council favored a union government, a mixture of elected civilians and popular military leaders, but one in which party politics would be abolished. Even though students and some intellectuals criticized this move, others defended it. Then, a national referendum was held in March 1978 
to allow the people to accept or reject the union government concept. But the opposition rejected the outcome of the referendum, arguing that it was neither free nor fair. They organized demonstrations against the government. The Hachiampong regime reacted by banning several organizations and jailing as many as 300 of its opponents. Then, an agenda for a new constitution was set and a general election was selected to hold in June 1979. The ad hoc committee had recommended a new party election and elected executive president and a cabinet whose members would be drawn from outside a single house national assembly. Under this arrangement, the military council would then step down, although its members could run for office as individuals. In July 1978, in a sudden move, other Supreme Military Council officers forced Achampong to resign, replacing him with Lieutenant General Frederick W. K. Akufo. The Supreme Military Council apparently acted in response to continuing pressure to find a solution to the country's economic dilemma. Inflation was estimated to be as high as 300% that year. There were shortage of basic commodities and cocoa production continued to fall. The council was also motivated by Achampong's failure to dampen rise political pressure for changes. Akufu, the new Supreme Military Council chairman, promised publicly to hand over political power to a new government to be elected by July 1, 1979. Despite Akufo's assurances, opposition to the SMC persisted, and the call for the formation of political parties intensified. In an effort to gain popular support, the Akufo government announced that the formation of political parties would be allowed after January 1979. He also granted amnesty to former members of both Nkrumah CPP and Busia's PP, as well as to all those convicted of subversion under Achampong. The decree lifting the ban on political parties went into effect on January 1, 1979, as promised. The Constitutional Assembly that had been working on a new constitution presented an approved draft and adjourned in May. All appeared set for a new attempt at constitutional governance in July. But something extraordinary happened in May 1979. So, what really happened? On the 15th of May 1979, some men of the Air Force attempted to overthrow the government. The revolution was quickly suppressed by the army, led by the army commander, General Odate Wellington. Ghanaians were angry and disapproved the attempted coup. But at the open trial of the leaders of the revolution, the explosive revelation of John Jerry Rawlings exposed the reasons behind their actions. Interestingly, many Ghanaians had a change of heart, wishing now that the coup had succeeded. However, John Jerry Rawlings was sentenced to death for the attempted coup. Meanwhile, while awaiting execution, John Jerry Rawlings was released from his prison cell by a group of young soldiers in the early hours of June 4, 1979. He immediately made a live broadcast to the nation, telling Ghanaians that the Rants had released him from his cell and that he was going to deal with the wrongdoers. He described it as a revolutionary justice. Ghanaians then had mixed feelings about this. While some were gripped with fear, others were thanking God for having sent a junior Jesus to save Ghanaians. Meanwhile, the army, through General Wellington again, tried to crush the revolution but was killed in action. Between midday and the evening, general silence and uncertainty gripped the nation before General Joshua Hamidu, the chief of defense staff, announced the sources of the coup. In another broadcast, General Hamidu had this to say, quote, I am happy to announce that the hypocrisy of our champion and our kufu since 1972 has been brought to an end. All members of the regime are to report to the Air Force station or any nearest police station for their own safety. We wish to assure you that election procedures would go on as planned. It is in the national interest. We have suffered too long. May God bless the nation. Then, 
a popular uprising arose. The next day, on the 5th of June 1979, Ghanaians came to understand that the coup was not the normal type. It was rather a popular revolt of the military against the military and the social injustice that had crippled Ghana, a once great and prosperous nation. The battle cries, let the blood flow, action, action became a popular song among lower ranks of the military, supported by students and the general public. The leaders of the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, the AFRC, were tired as tension rose to its limit. Power was in the hands of everyone. Students took to the streets and were joined by workers and the rural folks. Demonstrations took place in all parts of the country and there was call for justice and severe punishment for all offenders. The regime immediately began a house cleansing exercise against corruption. Three former military leaders of Ghana, Lieutenant General Afrifa, General Achampong, and Lieutenant General Akufo were all executed. Together with five other senior officers deemed to have been corrupt by the special court that was set up by the government. Numerous business entrepreneurs were also targeted and had their assets confiscated by the AFRC government. The Armed Forces Revolutionary Council allowed already scheduled elections to go ahead and handed over to the duly elected president, Dr. Hila Lyman of the People's National Party. Lyman became the only president of the Third Republic in Ghana. However, not long after, conditions returned to the pre-June 12 era, necessitating the second coming of Jerry Rawlings. That is a story for another day. Check this video here for in-depth coverage of the coup that removed Kwame Nkrumah in 1966. Remember to like this video and subscribe to his Pooh Media if you have not done so already. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.